Tony Broom Ministries welcomes you for the old time preaching from God's Word. Our scripture is Isaiah chapter 56, verses 1 through 8. The subject is Extraordinary God. Think about the hurricanes and the tornadoes and all these things that are happening. There's a song on the charts that's quite popular nowadays and says, Like a tidal wave washing over me, like a hurricane. I'm thinking, you dummy, that's not a time to play that song. It's one of the worst times in the world you can play that song. It's like the guy who got married, and I was one of them when I first got married, and the song was out. I got to leave it on my mind. That's not the time to sing that, all right? <laughs> I found out real quick that's not the time to sing that song. I thought I was doing good learning the gospel song. She thought I was fixing to check out. <laughs> We need to pray for those that are facing the devastation, the storm. The Bible said that these things will be on the increase. Wars, rumors of wars, earthquakes, famine, divers places, all these things that are happening. They're the beginning of sorrows. But just because they happen, that doesn't mean that we cannot intercede, that we cannot help those that are facing devastation, that we cannot pray, and that we cannot even believe on behalf of them and stand in the gap, and God can take the storm and do like He did on the Sea of Galilee. The disciples could have said, and people around could have said, well, storms are going to come. That's just part of life. You just have to go through it. Jesus didn't feel that way about it. He stood up in the midst of the boat against the raging waves and winds, and He said, peace be still. And he still says the same thing today. We would get on the side of the right and get on the Lord's side. And the song said, who's on the Lord's side among us? We'd get on the Lord's side and allow Him to come into covenant with us and we come into covenant with Him. We could turn these things around. We could still turn things around in our nation. And still turn things around in the White House. We could still turn things around in the economic situation. God is a good God. That's what we're talking about today. Extraordinary God. Scriptures are Isaiah chapter 56, verses 1 through 8. An ordinary God is a God which fits everybody's lifestyle. Doesn't matter whether you're gay, whether you're straight, whether you're left, whether you're right. You can make a God that will fit everybody's lifestyle. That's an ordinary God. Scripture said every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Judges chapter 17, verse 6. He is a God, a sweet little Jesus boy, who didn't offend anyone. A Jefferson Jesus. Perhaps you have heard of the Jefferson Testament or Bible. It used to be given out to a lot of military people. Jefferson Testament, Jefferson Bible. I love our country and I praise God for our founding fathers and George Washington and Thomas Jefferson being one of them. But Jefferson had some problems religiously. He was a God-fearing man, but he had some problems because he was what you might call a deist. He believed in the creation of God, that is, God created everything. But after God created everything, He kind of just set everything in motion, said, all right, you can take care of yourself. We know that God created everything, but He also not only created everything, but He still operates in His creation. He still has control of His creation. He is still very much interested in His creation. And so this Jefferson Bible, Jefferson Testament, he was the one that came out with that. Reference to the empty grave and resurrection of Jesus is not included. You might say, why in the world did he leave out the supernatural, the resurrection, the empty grave? Because Jefferson Jesus can be a Jesus like the one I like, like the one I want, one which is politically correct and appeals to everyone, everyone that is except the righteous and true redeemed. We don't want a 
sweet little Jesus boy. Yes, he is a sweet little Jesus boy. But he's more than that. He's God Almighty. Amen. He's the one who demands holiness from our life. Yes. An ordinary God is a Baptist God, a Methodist God, a non-denominational God, a Pentecostal God. That's an ordinary God. They talk about non-denominational. You ask somebody, what are you? What kind of denomination are you? What church do you go to? And they may say, well, I go to the Baptist church. I go to the Methodist church. I go to the Church of God or the Pentecostal church. And you have some people who say, I am a non-denominational. I go to a non-denominational church. Because we don't have a denomination. Well, they started a non-denominational church and before you know it, they had other non-denominational churches and they started having non-denominational churches all over the country and before you know it, the non-denomination became a denomination all over the country. It, even though they call it non-denominational, it's a denomination within itself. And so God is not an ordinary God. What about an extraordinary God? One which you cannot coop up in a pen or keep in a box. He is an extraordinary God. He is Elohim. He is El Elyon. He is the Lord our righteousness. He is Jehovah Jireh. He is Jehovah Rapha. He is the one who heals us. He is Jehovah Shammah. He is the one who blesses us. He is not an ordinary God. He is an extraordinary God. He is the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. In our scripture we see in verses 1 and 2, blessing the belittled. God promises blessings for those who do and live right. Thus saith the Lord, Keep ye judgment and do justice, for my salvation is near to come and my righteousness to be revealed. Blessed is the man that doeth this and the son of man that layeth hold on it, that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it and keepeth his hand from doing any evil. You are not saved because you live right, but you live right because you're saved. You cannot even live right until you get saved. And when you're saved and born again, God expects us to live right. We live right because we love God. And we're blessed because we live right and we do right. The thing that bothers us in our nation today is because people who do evil are rewarded for it. Seems like the more you evil you do, the more bad you do, the worse you are, the best and the better you get rewarded for it. You get a check every month. You get all kind of things because you do good and you ought to do that. But when you do bad, it seems like all these good things come your way. That's not the way it ought to be. You ought to be rewarded when you do right, when you do good. And God is an extraordinary God because He doesn't reward the criminal. He loves the criminal. He has mercy on the criminal. But God rewards those who do right, those who live right. There are benefits, brothers and sisters, for living right and doing right. There are benefits for being right with God. There are benefits for serving God and loving God. There are benefits for being a Christian, a son or a daughter of God, for loving Jesus. There are benefits from that. And some of them are out of this world, and some of them are in this world, but there are still benefits for loving God, for living right, for doing right. You'll find several times in these scriptures where the Sabbath day is mentioned. Those who keep the Sabbath from polluting it. Now, the Sabbath was the Old Covenant. Under the Old Covenant, the Sabbath, Shabbat, is Saturday. That's the Jewish Sabbath. And we still have a principle of the Sabbath day now. We don't have the Sabbath day. We have the Lord's Day Sunday because of the resurrection. But still the principle is there to keep one day set aside and set apart for God. And it used to be set aside away from secular employment. That you would come out from your employment. You would take a rest. And we had the blue laws. Most of us are old enough to remember the blue laws when businesses and things were closed down on Sunday. And it's good to regard that day as the Lord's day. And we see in our nation that that is missing. A lot of things are missing and things have gone crazy because we've gotten away from that. But to be fair about it, 
if you say that you're observing the Sabbath on Sunday, there's a problem with it because you're a day too late. See, you're a day too late. The Sabbath is Saturday. And so we love God and we do what's right, but when you try to make a law out of it, when you try to make a legislation out of it, when you try to put yourself under the old covenant, you're in a heap of trouble because the old covenant is not just made of one law of keeping the Sabbath. You got all those other things you got to do too. And so isn't it so much better that we serve this wonderful, glorious, extraordinary God under a God of grace and love and mercy where one day is just as good as another day and Jesus is Lord on Monday just like He is on Saturday and Sunday? And we can love Him every day of the week. God rewards those and blesses those Blessing the belittled, those who don't think much, and people don't think much about them, and they're put down. But if you love God, and you do what's right, and you live right, and you put the Lord first in your life, you may be put down in this world, but God will lift you up on high, and He'll bless you. Amen. Bewildering the orthodox. Orthodox is those who adhere to a certain standard in the old way, and we love the old time religions, not talking about that. But the Orthodox says, I've got this religion, and I'm depending on this religion to take me to heaven. But the extraordinary God not only blesses the belittled, but he bewilders the Orthodox. The extraordinary God totally flabbergasts everyone, especially those who thought they had him all figured out by including the excluded, such as eunuchs, the children of foreigners, and all Gentiles. Now, this goes against what people might think. The Jews thought he's a Jewish God. We got him all wrapped up in our Jewish box, and we're going to keep him that way. Some people think he's a Pentecostal God. We got him wrapped up in our Pentecostal box. And we're going to keep him that way. And there are some churches in the mountains who they thought he had a snake, and he was a snake God. We'll keep him in our box. And I say, you go ahead and keep him in your box. I'm like Brother Wendy Bagel. What are the back door? Reckon where do they want one? <laughs> When God said we have power to tread on serpents and snakes and we have power over snakes and scorpions, He wasn't talking about going out and picking up one. He was talking about having power spiritually over the forces of darkness. When you think you have God all figured out, then He comes along and He includes the excluded, those who everybody else leave out, like eunuchs and strangers and Gentiles. Oh my goodness, surely God's not going to save a Gentile, an uncircumcised Gentile dog. But the Scripture here in verses 3-7, through seven, it says, Neither let the son of the stranger that hath joined himself to the Lord speak, saying, The Lord hath utterly separated me from His people. Don't say, I'm not good enough. I'm not worthy enough. The Lord has separated me from the rest of His people because I'm black or because I'm white or because I come from a certain part of town or because I don't have a lot of money or because of this and that. God makes me different from the rest of His people. No, He does not. God includes us in the family of God. And no wonder we can sing, I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God because we're all in this family together. Neither let the eunuch say, Behold, I am a dry tree. Oh, I can't do anything. I'm just a dry tree. I'm not good for a woman. I won't never have any children. I'm just a dry tree. God says, Don't say that. He says, For thus saith the Lord unto the eunuchs that keep my Sabbaths. And there it is again. They keep the Sabbath. They choose the things that please me and take hold of my covenant. Even unto them will I give in mine house and within my walls a place and a name better than of sons and of daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall be cut off. God says, you think that's something that I'm going to have mercy on a stranger. You think that's something that I'm going to call a eunuch into my house. You think that's something. I'm going to give them a name better than of sons and of daughters. Israel thought they had it all made and in the shade because, oh, I'm an Israelite. I'm a stock of the sons and daughters of Abraham. I'm born into the Israelite family. But God says, I'm going to tell you something that's 
even better than that. I'm going to take somebody who is a eunuch, who's a nobody, somebody who's on skid row, somebody who's on alcohol. I wish I had somebody to help me preach. Somebody that's on drugs. Somebody that's all strung out. I'm going to take them and I'm going to bring them into my family. I'm going to bring them into my house. I'm going to give them a name that's better than sons and better than daughters. That's what God can do. That's the kind of God I serve. He's an extraordinary God. He's not come down just to fit in somebody's shoe or in somebody's box or in somebody's church building in somebody's ministerial program. He has His own program. That's our problem. We program Jesus right out of the church so many times. God said, if you just stand back and watch me work, let me work. Then people will get baptized in the Holy Ghost again. People will get saved again. People will get sanctified and get healed again. See, so why don't we see many people healed? Well, we done started tickling the feet of the community. Done started going after commercialism. Done started turning the church into a four-ring circus. God said, I'll give you a name. Better than sons and daughters. It'll be even an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. Why? Because it's the name of Jesus. You don't have to be a Jew to have the name of Jesus attached to you. He came to His own. He came to the Jews, but His own received Him not. But as many as received Him to them, gave He power to become the sons of God. Even to those who believe on His name. And that's the name that we're talking about. He's given us a name. I thank God for my name. I know my name's not much. Just a broom, a broomstick, Swiss broom. Oh my goodness. Yeah, I used to have some straw on the broom. Now it's just a hub. Just a... <laughs> Nothing much to a broom. But that's not the name I'm talking about. I'm talking about the name that's above every name. I'm talking about that name. I'm going to give you a name that would not be cut off. Also the sons of the stranger that joined themselves to the Lord to serve Him and to love the name of the Lord, to be His servants, everyone that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it and take it hold of My covenant. There it is. You're taking hold of the covenant of God. You may not be of the stock of Abraham. You may not can do all the things right. You're taking hold of My covenant. You want to serve God. You want to love God. There's nobody who wants to love God and who wants to serve God that God's going turn around and from up in the chair in the sky he's going to take a big wad of chewing gum and plop it on top of your head and make fun of you and spit on you. That's not the kind of God I serve. I serve an extraordinary God. If you want to love God, if you want to serve God, if you want to do what's right, God will make a way that you can do what's right. Even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. We don't deserve to be here, but the song says, Thank God I belong. And He's brought me to the banqueting table, and His banner over me is love. Oh, hallelujah. He has brought me and lifted me up. He's given me purpose. He's given me direction. He's given me a place in life. He's given me something worth living for. I don't have to take a 45 and put it to my head. When I got John 3.16, and He gave me reason to live. I will bring them to my holy mountain. I will bring them into my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon mine altar. Now those who persist in bringing themselves under the old covenant and keeping the Sabbath and doing all this, God said you have a heart of that, you have a desire of that. That's wonderful. But those of us in the day in which we live, you want to serve God, you want to please God, and you talk about keeping the Sabbath, and you talk about eating the right diet. All right, let's go ahead and bring your lamb to the temple. Go ahead and get your sacrifices. Bring the oxen up here and slay them and do all this. You say, no, we don't have to do all that. Yeah, but wait a minute now. You can't ch choose one without taking all of it. James said if we offend in one point, we're guilty of all. So if you're going to bring yourself under that old law, I want you to know that even Peter and the apostles who are as pure Jews as you could get, I guess, they said, we cannot do that. We cannot put a yoke upon the neck of these Gentile brothers that not even we or our fathers were able to bear. 
And so what do we do? We trust in the living God. We trust in this extraordinary God. We trust in Jesus Christ. Jesus kept the law for me. I could not keep it myself. I don't have to bring a sacrifice to the temple. I come into the temple with a sacrifice of praise because Jesus is my sacrifice. He is the supreme sacrifice for me. Mine house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. And that's why Jesus went in there and he was mad as fire. Righteously so. He went in that temple. He drove those people out who were buying and selling in the temple. And if he came into the temple today, he would still drive them out. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. He'd do the same thing now as he would then. Because they're making a merchandise. They're making a mock out of the house of God. And he'd do the same thing now as he did then. And why did he do it? He said, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. And you can find it in the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John chapter 2. And my house will be called a house of prayer. The zeal of your house has eaten me up. It's consumed me. This thing got a hold of me. And I've got to do something. And so he got up from there. He drove them all out. Turned the tables over. Poured all the money out. And said, get these things out of here. That's what he would do now. Because these things take away from the Holy Ghost. They take away from the supernatural. They take away from the Word of God. And he says, this is my house of prayer for all people. This is not just for one race or one creed or one color. It's for everybody. Yeah. The church has got to be a place for everybody. It's got to be a place for those who want to come and serve God. Now, if you want to come and cause trouble, you need to go on down to the pool hall where they can go ahead and pick you up. <laughs> But if you come to worship God, it doesn't matter whether you're big, whether you're little, whether you're black, whether you're white, whether you're red, whether you're yellow, whether you're rich, whether you're poor, it doesn't matter about all that. If you come to worship God and find God, you ought to be able to find Him in His house of prayer. Yes. Begetting the unbegotten. The only begotten begets unbegottens by begetting them again, birthing them into the royal family by His blood and bestowing them as belonging to the body. The Scripture says so much about that. James says He has begotten us again through the new birth. And He has begotten us as sons and daughters of God. Verse 8 of Isaiah 56, The Lord God gathereth, which gathereth the outcasts of Israel, saith, Yet will I gather others to Him beside those that are gathered unto Him. I'm gathering the outcasts of Israel. I'm bringing Israel back from captivity. But I'll do better than that. I'll gather others to Him beside those who are gathered to Him. I'll reach out to those who nobody doesn't want to have anything to do with. I'll reach out to people you don't like. I'll reach out to people, and it's just like Leah in the Old Testament. Do you remember when... Jacob served for Rachel and Uncle Laban was a trickster too. He tricked old Jacob and instead of Rachel, he gave him Leah first. And the scripture has a nice way of dealing with all of us. He didn't say Leah was <clears throat> ugly. He just said she was tender-eyed. King James Bible is so nice. That's why you better buy you one and keep it. <laughs> She's tender-eyed. But you know what else it said about her? It said, when the Lord saw that she was hated, she was the one who God opened her womb. Not the other one. Sometimes the one that we think so much about, we think we got it all figured out, and God said, all right, I'll show you. And He takes the one who was hated and gives her all these bunch of boys, and the other one didn't have but two, and one of them basically killed her. She did, went into heart labor and died when the baby was born. Don't pray for a baby, it might kill you, you know. Especially if you wait till you get old enough like Abraham and Sarah. Lord, it'd kill me. And I wouldn't have to have a 45. I'd have a 30 off six stroke. The same God who gathers the Israel, and He will gather them again, and He will put them back in their land. And if God can do that, He can gather all over the world. And the book of the Revelation talks about it. And John chapter 10 verse 16 talks about it. Other sheep I have which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. 
It's not a Pentecostal fold or a Baptist fold or a Jewish fold. It's not just for Israel. It's not just Gentiles. It's Jew and Gentile, red and yellow, black and white. And we're all precious in His sight. And He's overcome that wall. He's jumped over that wall. And Ephesians chapter 2 talks about it. He's made of one twain, one new man. And He's brought us all together. It's no Jew and Gentile anymore. It's no rich and poor anymore. It's not even male and female. Some people have taken that and gone the wrong way with it and made a neuter gender thing that God never intended. He's not talking about that. But He's talking about in Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter whether you're a man, whether you're a woman, whether you're whatever. It's that you are in the family of God. That you're born again. That you're serving God. That you're loving God. And He tells John about it all over the world from every nation kindred people nation tribe and tongue he has made us kings unto our god and priests and we will rule and reign with him forever extraordinary god i'm glad that i don't serve an ordinary god an ordinary god is allah and buddha and Hare Krishna and all these other Ahs and these idol gods that, that stand up and they have noses but they can't smell. They have hands but they can't handle. They have legs and arms but they can't go anywhere. You have to move them. You have to take them wherever you want them to go. They have throats but they cannot speak through their throat. They can't hear you when you pray to them. They can't save you. They can't do anything to you. I'm glad I don't serve a God like that. I'm glad I serve the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Let's give him some praise. You have been listening to a sermon from God's Anointed Word. The subject has been Extraordinary God. This has been a production of Tony Broom Ministries.